pleasure to induce, introduce our speaker for today, uh, Rick Stauffer. Uh, Rick um, is a uh, trainee from the University of Virginia where he did his cardiology and interventional cardiology fellowship, and he also spent some time in, in the laboratory of um, Gary Owens, who's one of the world-renowned leaders in our understanding of smooth muscle cell biology. Um, Rick left uh, the University of Virginia and uh, went to the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston uh, about, I think, two or three months before I got there, uh, recruited by Marshall Runge when Marshall was the chief of cardiology. And uh, Rick uh, uh, joined the cath lab as, as an interventional cardiologist and also began to develop his um, research interests in uh, smooth muscle cell biology as it related to problems like uh, restenosis after stent implantation. Uh, Rick came here uh, in 2000 and, and shortly after that became the director of uh, our uh, cardiac cath lab and interventional cardiology program. Uh, he's continued to develop a spectacular research program. He's the director of um, our uh, NIH funded training grant in, uh, for our cardiology fellowship. Uh, and he uh, has developed a, a, a regional and national reputation as a spectacular interventional cardiologist. And I would say that one of the things that I respect about Rick as an interventional cardiologist is that um, most interventional cardiologists lack a word in, in their vocab vocabulary, and that word is no. Uh, and Rick certainly uh, says no sometimes uh, in the cath lab when he, he thinks that he's not going to be able to help the patient. I think that's an attitude that uh, has trickled down through the rest of, of the cath lab at UNC, and I think that's, that's one of the things that makes our uh, program uh, a great one. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Rick, who's going to talk about what you need to know about drug eluting stents. So uh, thanks, Cam, for the kind introduction, and to Marshall for letting me speak. Uh, there's no conflicts of interest uh, relative to this talk, and I will discuss off-label uses, as most coronary stents are used off-label. So here I just want to put it, uh, this talk into a personal uh, bent here. So it's a hypothetical case, 60-year-old male, faculty member in the Department of Medicine, no prior history of cardiovascular disease, but has chest tightness while walking to the grand rounds on drug-eluting stents. Pain, pain radiates down his left arm, no nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis. The pain began two weeks ago, is now occurring with less and less provocation. So he ends up in our catheterization laboratory, and that's what his right coronary looks like. The question is, how are we going to treat this individual and what type of uh, stent to use? And this is obviously hypothetical, but it'll affect probably a third of the people in this room at some point in time. The areas I want to cover today, I want to give you a brief overview of the history of percutaneous coronary invention. I think to really understand drug-looting stents, you have to know where we've been and where we're headed. I'm going to talk about the four currently available, available drug eluting stents, uh, address the question of whether drug eluting stents are safe, and then at the end of the talk, go over some of the uh, current research and where we're headed with that. Drug eluting stents is a huge area, and I'm just going to give you a brief uh, bird's eye view with uh, sort of my bent on things, but I want to point out the limitations of any bird's eye view. So if any of you remember, last fall, UNC and Duke were opening their football seasons on the same day. UNC had planned to have a, a parachutist bring in the game ball and hand it to the referees at the 50-yard line. Uh, this is what happened. According to a UNC official, the plane was in the air, but the jumpers from Virginia-based Air Adventures opted to cancel the leap into Keenan Stadium because of a severe weather front, which would later delay both games. Evidently, when the clouds eventually opened, the pilot thought they were over the correct stadium and the skydivers jumped realizing only when they landed in Wallace Wade that they were in the wrong place. In about five years, maybe this will be funny. So, so the limitations of a bird's eye view. The first angioplasty was performed uh, 32 years ago. The picture in the bottom right is Andreas Grunzik, who is the father of all uh, percutaneous interventions, whether coronary or peripheral. Right above him, you see a picture of one of the original balloon uh, angioplasty catheters they were, these were made in Grunzig's kitchen. So the first patient was a 38-year-old insurance salesman in Zurich. He had lifestyle-limiting angina but refused coronary bypass operation. Grunzig offered him balloon angioplasty. While he was the first patient, the uh, balloons had been used in a, a number of animals. 
There had been 200 percutaneous peripheral interventions and a handful of cases performed in the operating room with the chest open before the balloon was inflated. On the uh, left here is a picture of his left anterior descending in 1977. And when he underwent angiography 23 years later, when his chest pain recurred, you can see that area actually looked fine on repeat angiography. And this was the first patient. Interestingly, Grunzig brought three balloons to that case. The first two would not inflate. The third one did, and thus began the air percutaneous intervention. These are photomicrographs from our pathology uh, department here showing an atherosclerotic artery. It's not inherently obvious to me that a balloon angioplasty would work. You can see the atherosclerotic formation and the thought of putting a balloon in and actually improving clinical outcomes, I think was a jump of faith and therefore it was so important to do the animal uh, research. Uh, we commonly get questions from patients, where does the plaque go when you put in the balloon? And the answer is the plaque doesn't really go anywhere. What you do is uh, rupture the plaque form these fissures, possibly dissections, stretch the artery, and that's what leads to improved blood flow. Angioplasty began in uh, the late 70s. By 1994, it was widely accepted, and it widely access, uh, accepted because it was successful. So this is a review from the New England Journal of Medicine, 94. Just a couple of quotes. PTCA, which in this instance means balloon angioplasty because stents were not improved until 1994 provides effective release of stable angina in most patients with single vessel coronary artery disease, and in patients with evolving infarction, anti-grade flow and infarct-related artery was restored in about 95% of patients. And even today, these are the two primary indications for any percutaneous intervention, improved symptoms of stable angina and treatment of acute coronary syndromes where there's blood clot and occlusion of the artery. But with the advent of balloon angioplasty, we had <clears throat> the development of two diseases which had not existed before. The first one was abrupt closure, and this is when you put an angioplasty balloon in and the artery closed unexpectedly, uh, usually associated with the uh, ischemic changes on the EKG, chest pain, and possibly hemodynamic uh, compromise. Uh, the other new disease was restenosis, and this is where the artery would form a healing reaction and eventually narrow over a period of months to where blood flow was obstructed again. On the bottom right-hand side is a picture of a dissection, again, in the right coronary artery. You can see an angioplasty wired down in the distal vessel. A balloon was inflated. The artery dissected and it closed acutely. This is obviously a problem. Restenosis, in contrast to dissection, is not an acute problem and not a complication. This is a natural healing response but when it becomes over-exuberant, that's when it causes clinical problems. So on the bottom left is a photomicrograph. You can see formation of neointima to where it obstructs the lumen. On the upper right is a schematic showing the different mechanisms involved. One is intimal proliferation. Smooth muscle cells proliferate and secrete extracellular matrix. There's obviously thrombus at the site of a vascular injury. The artery recoils after it is dilated with a balloon and also re-endothelialization. So to counteract the problems of acute dissection and restenosis, the intracoronary stent was developed. So it was first developed in 1985, Julio Palmas, and the first intracoronary use was in 1986. And you can see here a picture of a stent and also what an artery looks like before and after it was stented. The stent provides a scaffolding, therefore uh, taking the dissection out of play by tacking the uh, vessel back up to the wall. And also, by preventing recoil, it limits or reduces the incidence of restenosis. This is a table from the percutaneous coronary intervention guidelines from the ACC and AHA. I show this just to convince you that stents do uh, reduce the incidence of restenosis. These are the various studies which have looked at this question. Here is restenosis with the stent, restenosis balloon angioplasty. In all the studies, one exception the stents reduced the incidence of restenosis. Stents also reduced the need for emergency bypass surgery. So those of you who are involved in uh, cardiovascular disease and remember the early days of coronary interventions, no intervention was performed unless you had a operating room on standby. The reason for that was in the early days, up to 8 to 10 percent of patients would require a need for emergency bypass. With the advent of stents, the 
numbers reduced dramatically. This is a paper by Eric Yang, one of our faculty members when he was at Mayo Clinic. Now the incidence of emergency cabbage out of our cath lab is significantly less than 1%. But with the advent of stents, while that helped with restenosis and abrupt closure, we now had the advent of two new diseases, instant restenosis and stent thrombosis. So this is an angiogram. There's a stent in here. You can see a diffuse process, which is obstructing blood flow. On intravascular ultrasound, you get this neo-intimal formation, which again, when over, uh, over exuberant, can obstruct blood flow. <coughs> it's important to realize that instant restenosis is not a form of atherosclerosis, at least as we traditionally think of it. So here's a normal artery on pathology. On ultrasound, you can see there's minimal intima, the normal vessel architecture with the median adventitia. Atherosclerosis is an eccentric process forming here in one side of the artery. Pathologically, again, it uh, <laughs> favors one side of the artery. Instant restenosis is concentric and seen throughout the artery. The reason this is important is there are two different biological processes involved. A lot of work was invested in the 80s and 90s in understanding this process. Uh, Marshall Runge made many contributions, as did uh, others in this room. But basically, it's understood to occur in these waves now. Initially, when you put a stent in, you have localized thrombosis. This is followed by a wave of inflammatory cells uh, brought by uh, platelets and other uh, mediators that recruit them to the site of vascular injury. This is followed by proliferation, some by inflammatory cells, mostly by smooth muscle cells, and then later by extracellular matrix production. Understanding the biology led to then the, directly to the development of the drug-eluting stent. The hypothesis is that instant restenosis is mainly a proliferative process. If you can block proliferation, you not only block the cellular mass, but then the extracellular matrix production. And therefore, the drug-eluting stents were designed specifically to prevent instant restenosis by inhibiting cellular proliferation via local delivery of high-dose anti-proliferative medications. And the drugs currently available on the stents, paclitaxel, and sirolimus and its analogs all directly inhibit cell cycle proliferation by interfering with the cell cycle. So let me briefly go through the components of a drug-eluting stent, at least as they're currently available. The first thing is the scaffolding. The scaffolding is a bare metal stent made either out of stainless steel or chromium cobalt. The second thing, and one that we're realizing now uh, is more and more important, is the polymer. The polymer is used to attach the uh, drug to the stent, to the metal, and also to control the re release. What you have is a stent strut. You put a base coat of the polymer on to enable the drug, which is in also immersed in polymer, to stick. And then you have an overspray of the polymer, which prevents the drug from being uh, wiped off when it's touched during implantation. After the drug is eluded over a period of uh, days, weeks, and months, which we'll go over in a minute, what is left is your stent strut and your post-dilution residual polymer. The third component is the drug. The uh, drug, as I mentioned, paclitaxel for one stent, sirolimus and its analogs for the other three stents. There's some new development in drugs, but many of the companies have settled on the uh, olimus-like drugs because they're so well studied. And lastly, there's a delivery system, the balloon and catheter by which we implant the drug-eluting stent. These are the four FDA-approved drug-eluting stents as of today. The Cypher stent came out first, April 2003, stainless steel, sirolimus as a drug. The second stent, approximately a year later, was a taxis, again stainless steel, this time paclitaxel. Within the last year or so, we've had approval of the first two chromium cobalt stents, these are both Olimus drugs, very similar to Sirolimus. Even though three of the stents have similar drugs, they're very different release kinetics. So on here is the schematic I showed you, the biological process underlying restenosis. And you can see the imp important time frame is somewhere around day seven. The endeavor tried to take advantage of that by eluding all the drug within the first two weeks. Cypher and Zients thought that this and this were both equally important. They aimed to have the drug released by 30 days. The taxis stent actually does not fully release the drug at any time. 
and you'll still have 90% of the drug on the stent if you look years later. So similar drugs on these three, different release kinetics. Again, the release kinetics are controlled by the polymer. So just knowing the type of stent and the drug does not fully characterize the stent. So here are some pictures showing that drug eluting stents, which were designed to reduce intimal hyperplasia, actually do that very well. Here's a lesion, preangioplasty, you can see an ultrasound, the atherosclerotic lesion. A stent is implanted, you can see the stent struts. And then six to eight months later, this patient was in a clinical trial and came back for an angiogram. There is no difference, there is no intimal proliferation. Drug eluting stents are very effective at blocking that. Here's a patient we treated at UNC. This is a cipher drug eluting stent in a diabetic five months later. These are the stent struts. There's essentially nothing forming inside of the stent. In contrast, you can see a case of instant restenosis here where you have concentric formation of a new uh, intima. The reduction in intimal formation directly translates into a reduction in need for a second revascularization procedure. This is a meta-analysis from uh, BMJ published last year, looking at just the two stents which have been around the longest. Bare metal stents, whether you look at one to four years, patients are gonna have much more likely to require a second revascularization procedure than with the drug eluting stents. Either you have diabetes or without diabetes, it doesn't matter. These stents are very effective at reducing restenosis and the need for a second procedure. But all is not well. And we realized that when this report came out in 2004 of late stent thrombosis. Late stent thrombosis occurs more than a year out after a patient's had a drug eluting stent. And you can see here the four initial patients reported they all had stopped their antiplatelet therapy for a uh, medical procedure, all developed thrombosis within the stent. Stent thrombosis is a lethal disease and one not to be taken lightly. This is a right coronary artery. You can see there's a thrombotic occlusion to side of a prior stent. EKG changes are as you'd expect. The interesting thing, and one that has not been fully explained, is why it's so much more lethal than an ST elevation MI. So if you have a patient, he closes his right coronary on his own, comes in, his 30-day mortality based on current studies is approximately 5%. If you have a stent that thrombosis, your mortality is 30%. So stent thrombosis is a lethal, lethal disease and much more lethal than a ST elevation MI. So now we have a, another new disease. So just going through the history, balloon angioplasty, we had abrupt closure occurring 3 to 5%, restenosis in 30 to 40%, bare metal stents, stent thrombosis in 1%, instant restenosis in 10 to 20%, now we have drug eluting stents, late and very late stent thrombosis. Less than 1%, but very important nonetheless. Here are just four studies showing the incidence of late stent thrombosis. I just put this slide in to remind you all that the importance of not discontinuing Plavix prematurely. This is a meta-analysis from JAMA seven years ago. Premature discontinuation, discontinuation of antiplatelet therapy and by premature, it generally means within the first year, you increase the risk to the patient of stent thrombosis of 90-fold. So realizing it's a lethal disease, be very cautious stopping Plavix. This uh, will increase the patient's risk of stent thrombosis. We recently had a patient, the uh, Plavix was stopped soon after drug eluting stent to have a nasal polyp biopsy. The physicians involved did not realize the uh, downside of that, the patient essentially uh, traded her inferior wall of her heart for a nasal uh, biopsy. So just be careful. Well, with the realization of stent thrombosis, we went through a, uh, a, a realization of the importance of, of uh, drug eluting stents. It wasn't all upside, there was some downside. We went from the end of heart disease declared by U.S. News and World Report after the first drug eluting stent came out to are these as safe as you think? by that well-known medical journal, Forbes, who, <laughs> as we began to realize the hassle. So let's, let's talk about whether drug eluting stents are safe. I, I'll give you the take home message before I go through the data, and I think they are safe. I think the worry has been overblown. There are cases of stent thrombosis and very late stent thrombosis, but I think when we look at the data, we'll realize 
is not nearly as widespread as originally thought. So I'm just going to take you through some historical analysis. This is a meta-analysis from Lancet. It looked at 11 randomized trials, 5,000 patients, published in 2004. You can see restenosis is reduced by a factor of uh, 3 to 1 compared to bare metal stents. This directly translates into a reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events. No effect on MI, no effect on death. These are uh, data presented at the FDA hearing in December 2006, looking at the safety of drug-eluting stents. These are various subgroups treated with cipher. These are various subgroups uh, treated with taxes. You can see in all case in all uh, subgroups favored cipher and favored taxes. No matter which group you looked at, the drug-eluting stent had better outcomes than patients treated with bare metal stents. And also, as the FDA concluded, there is stent thrombosis, but it rejects the increased death MI risk for off-label, on-label DES use. So while there was concern that there was associated, uh, there was increased death in MI with DES because of stent thrombosis, it turns out while there is stent thrombosis, it's at a very low level and outweighed by the benefits uh, on reducing re stenosis. I now take you to a meta-analysis in Lancet. 38 randomized trials, 18,000 patients, no difference in death and MI, bare metal stent versus drug eluting stent. So the randomized trials have shown no difference, no safety signal for drug eluting stents. Well, then the question comes up, well, maybe it's not the randomized patient. Maybe it's a real-life patient that's having problems. So as, as you all know, randomized trial enroll a certain type of patient. They tend to be younger, healthier, fewer comorbidities, than seen in the type of patients we treat every day. And so the question came up, maybe we're missing uh, adverse outcomes because we're not enrolling the highest risk patients. And this is a headline from the European Society of Cardiology meeting uh, several years ago, which raised the issue, drug eluting stents may not be as safe as we think. And here is the data uh, published in 2007, which provided some background for that view. So this is the SCAR study group. Lagervist, James, et al., what they found, drug eluting stents were associated with an increased risk of death as compared with bare metal stents. The trend appeared after six months when the risk of death was a half a percentage point higher and the composite of death or MI was a half to one percentage point higher per year. The long-term safety of drug eluting stents needs to be ascertained in large randomized trials. And this study got quite a lot of play, published in the New England Journal and cited in all the various mass media outlets. And here's the data. So if you look at various uh, endpoints, they're not statistically significant unless you look at death. The lines separate at about a year and a half. They reach statistical significance after two years. Increased risk of death, drug eluting stent versus bare metal stent. And this raised all kinds of safety signals. And the use of drug eluting stents in the United States dropped from 85% of patients to less than 60% of patients. But now let's fast forward two years. Last month, James Lagervist Scar Group, same study group. Now, there are a new conclusion. As compared with bare metal stents, drug eluting stents are associated with a similar long term incident of death or MI and provide a clinically important decrease in the rate of re stenosis among high risk patients. So, now how can this be, right? How can they change uh, 180 degrees in two years? Well, this is their data from their most recent paper. Uh, this is the death down here. This is where it separated earlier. Now the lines have come back together. So the methods are now we're looking at 48,000 patients, so many more than the earlier study, between 2003 and 2006. The other one was just 2003 and 2004. Patients who received a drug eluting stent in 2003 had a significantly higher rate of late events than patients who received bare metal stents in the same year, but we did not observe any difference in outcome among patients treated in later years. And again, their conclusion are, well, drug eluting stents no increased risk of death or MI, and a benefit on re stenosis. So a complete change, or as this guy says, my bad. The other question about the safety of drug eluting stents came up in ST elevation MI, and this was raised by the uh, Grace Registry. So as uh, some of you may know, the Grace Registry is a 
uh, multinational registry. They enroll a lot of patients. They've actually produced several important findings. There's the GRACE risk score for predicting outcomes in patients with non-STEMIs. Uh, we use the TIMI risk score at UNC, but the GRACE risk score is equally valid and used many places, especially Europe. So this is their study published earlier this year, increased risk of death with uh, drug-eluting stents. Again, these are in patients with the elevation MI compared to bare metal stents. This also received a lot of play. But if you look at the meta-analysis, and this is also published this year, GRACE is an outlier. So there's now 13 studies looking at death within two years, patients, 3S and STEMIs, and GRACE is the only one which showed adverse outcomes. So again, two studies, both from 2006, 2007, raised safety concerns. The first one has been, uh, the conclusions have been changed by the authors based on additional data. And the GRACE study, while they're sticking by their conclusions, their uh, data has not been replicated by other groups. So in terms of currently available uh, drug-eluting stents, I think we can make a few uh, conclusions. One, uh, available drug-eluting stents reduce the rate of restenosis by at least 50%. And remember, uh, decreased restenosis directly translates into a reduced need for a second revascularization procedure. There's no difference in death or MI compared to bare metal stents, no increased risk of death in patients with STEMI, and no difference in early stent thrombosis, increase in late and very late stent thrombosis that is a real problem, but occurs in a very small number of patients. So here's just a graph showing the progress we've made. Balloon angioplasty, the rate of restenosis, 30 to 40 percent. Bare metal stents, 15 to 20 percent. Drug eluting stents, we're now down around 5 percent. So I'm going to finish the talk by just going through what's uh, on the horizon. The clinical research trials are ongoing, and to try to convince you that uh, while we have good technology today, we'll probably even have better technology tomorrow. So this is just the power of innovation in uh, interventional cardiology. Stent patents, 400. Uh, 15 years ago, greater than 7,000 in 2005. The Palmaz stent is reportedly worth a million dollars a day. Palmaz now owns a vineyard in California. 2004, uh, one of the first uh, vascular guide wires was actually a modified VW clutch cable. There's now more than 5,700 guide wire patents. There's a lot of technology, a lot of innovation, obviously a lot of money involved in interventional cardiology. I think one of the things we have learned over the last uh, five years is that it's a balancing act. On one side, you have too much healing, you have restenosis which leads to angina and a need for a second revascularization procedure. On the other side of the balance, you have not enough healing, which can then lead to stent thrombosis. And so the goal is not to completely inhibit this process, but rather to modify it so you have enough healing to prevent stent thrombosis, but not too much healing where you get luminal narrowing and restenosis. This is a review from last year, just talking about novel advances. There's going to be new drugs, so I think that's less of an interest than ways to deliver them. New polymers, new techniques of elution, pro-healing approach, new biologic targets, and then absorbable stents. In the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on three of these. I, I must say right up front, these are just picks that I, I uh, uh, made based on my interest and to give you an overview. They're by no means exhaustive in all the research that's going on. So I want to talk first about polymers. This is the most common polymer used, right, the uh, contact lens, but they're actually used in many uh, biomedical devices. In the first and second generation stents, we had durable stent polymers, which were designed to control the release of the drug and to prevent inadvertent loss of the drug. What we have found is the polymer, which remains behind after the drug is eluted, can have pro-inflammatory and thrombogenic effects. Therefore, the focus of the new generation stents is moving from durable to bioabsorbable polymers and making polymers more biocompatible. These are the currently available stents. These are the polymers. They're all different. They're all uh, difficult to compare across, across the stents because their use has been uh, only studied in this type of application for the last few years. But again, you can see you have the stent strut and then the polymer on top as a way to elute the drug. 
After the drug is gone, the polymer remains. New polymers in clinical trials called, include the Resolute study. We're actively enrolling patients in this trial here. This polymer is more biocompatible than the existing polymers. It's a proprietary polymer, however, and therefore uh, details are limited. The NEVO study is also coming online soon. Again, a new polymer, in this case also a new stent. We will uh, be enrolling patients in that trial as the year goes on. There's also bioabsorbable polymers. So these are durable polymers, more biocompatible. These are polymers which are gone after a period of time when the stent is implanted. I'm just going to talk briefly about the biolimus uh, eluding stent. This is stainless steel. And it's actually been studied in Europe. Here is the LEADERS trial, studied in 1,700 patients. Looking at death MI, this is target vessel revascularization, basically a second angioplasty or the need for bypass surgery. And you can see there's no statistical difference between the groups. So this shows that uh, the new polymer is safe. It looks to be effective at least out to nine months. The question of whether it's better than the existing polymers will uh, involve more data. But again, the importance of the bio, um, the bioabsorbable polymer is not in the first nine months, but after it's absorbed, whether it reduces the risk of late stent thrombosis, and those data will come out over the next year or two. I'll briefly mention the genus stent. This stent has a very novel uh, idea behind it of trying to capture the endothelial progenitor cells out of the bloodstream using an antibody. The thinking here is if you can bring endothelial progenitor cells to a stent surface, that stent will endothelialize faster and therefore be less thrombogenic and safer long term. Uh, as you all know, endothelial cells, uh, progenitor cells are bone marrow derived. They can differentiate in functional endothelial cells, and they're actually recruited at sites of vascular injury. The drug used is a monoclonal anti-human CD34 antibody. This is a study published uh, several years ago, a group of patients who underwent stent implantation. These are CD34 positive uh, progenitor cells appearing in the bloodstream. So it turns out if you put in a sirolimus eluding stent, realizing there's only 10 patients, they did not see an increase in EPCs. But with bare metal stents, whether the patient developed restenosis or not, in both groups, EPCs went up. So based on this data, the thinking was the stents are there to recruit. But as this study pointed out, CD34 positive cells are not just endothelial progenitor cells, they're also smooth muscle cell progenitor cells and therefore you may actually be contributing to restenosis. So I point this study out not to uh, say that we've solved the problem by any means, but just to point out the complexity, the idea of recruiting endothelial progenitor cells theoretically makes sense, but until you actually implant it in humans, you don't know whether you're actually benefiting through endothelial cell recruitment or potentially harming through smooth muscle cell recruitment. So lastly, I'm just going to finish up talking about bioabsorbable stents, which I suspect will get the most play as uh, we go forward from this point. The thinking behind bioabsorbable stents is provide scaffolding and a drug only for the time period needed to inhibit restenosis. So obviously, if the stent disappears, uh, you don't need to worry about stent thrombosis. A lack of persistent metal and polymer, you don't have late stent thrombosis, you don't have hypersensitivity reaction, you don't have stent fractures. And then... Uh, less uh, important benefits, but still uh, uh, potentially useful. You can permit non-invasive imaging. This is basically CT angiography, which is difficult to do now if there's a stent in place because of artifact. And also you can have bypass surgery if you have a metallic stent across a surgical landing zone that precludes uh, bypass operation in that artery. These are the four bioabsorbable stents currently being uh, evaluated in clinical trials. You can see them all on this side. You can see what they're made of here. There are different approaches and different amount of scaffolding, different kinetics of when the stent is resorbed, different clinical outcomes. This is just to highlight the polylactic acid stents, what happens over a period of time. You have hydrolysis. This leads to a decrease in molecular weight, formation of lactic acid, loss of mass in the stent, and eventually metabolism of the stent to carbon dioxide and water over a period of time. And again, uh, it varies, but for most stents, they're looking at six to nine months. You take your stent and you end up with carbon dioxide and water. This is just schematic what happens. This is a period of months. 
the molecular weight of the polylactic acid decreases, the strength of the stent decreases, the mass of the stent, the stent itself is gone after a period of time. These stents are uh, schematically the same as our current stents. You have a drug polymer matrix on the outside, and then you have the stent here. The, the difference is this stent will be bioabsorbed over time, and in many cases the polymer is made out of polycalactic acid, which also is absorbed over time. These are some early results with uh, the BVS stent. This is the stent, what it looks like. This it has two markers, so you can place it. But what I really want to show you was what happens over a period of time. So this is after it goes in. These are stent struts. And then this is six months later. Down here, the stent struts have disappeared. These holes here were where the stent struts were when I was first put in. This is the ABSORB study. This is the largest uh, study of this stent. It has a grand total of 30 patients. There is a uh, single stent size, 3 millimeters by uh, 12. And for the last two patients, you could actually use a 3 millimeter by 18. This is just a first-in-man study, obviously just trying to uh, accumulate some data. This is performed uh, overseas. <laughs> what they found at six months, there's low rates of MACE. There's actually one non-QMI, no death, no restenosis. But they did find there was a higher than expected late loss and restenosis rate. And this was thought to be due to the shrinkage in the stent. The stent shrank too soon, and without the scaffolding, you got some, uh, some vessel recoil. The two-year data, which was just published within the last few weeks, showed that at least one-third of the stent had been absorbed. And the reason it says at least one-third is because when a stent is resorbed, it's replaced by a proteoglycan and other matrix, and sometimes that cannot be differentiated using the technologies used in this study. And then lastly, normal healing. Start on this side. If you just focus on the middle, these are looking at vasomotion. So this is before, this is baseline, this is the stent segment, this is acetylcholine, in a normal vessel, it'll dilate. In an abnormal vessel, it'll vasoconstrict. But the most interesting thing is the response to the nitroglycerin. There are actually some patients who are having a vasodilatory response to the nitroglycerin. Obviously, if you have a metallic stent, the artery will not dilate to nitroglycerin. The resolution of the bioabsorbable stent restores that, at least in some patients. And then also, you can see the effect of the, uh, the acetylcholine test, either proximal and distal. Distally, it looks like there is normal uh, vasomotion. Looking over here, <coughs> you can see uh, intravascular ultrasound looking at stent struts over a period of time. They're clearly present immediately after stenting, less present as time goes on. This is virtual histology, which basically uses data. The ultrasound wave goes out, comes back, and using how fast it comes back, you can determine whether it's fibrous tissue, calcified, or lipid. The red is a lipid core. This white here is stent struts that have been replaced by uh, extracellular matrix. And here at two-year follow-up, you can see you now have a fibrous cap throughout the, uh, uh, isolating the uh, atherosclerotic tissue from the blood movement. So this is just one patient, but that would obviously be an ideal outcome for a bioabsorbable stent if not only the stent is gone, but it's been replaced by a fibrous tissue which makes plaque rupture and an acute coronary syndrome. Uh, less likely. So let me just summarize uh, what I've tried to show you today. In any dr uh, drug eluting stent, there's an important interplay between the stent, the polymer, and the drug. The currently available drug eluting stents, at least compared to bare metal stents, reduce intimal hyperplasia, decrease restenosis, and the need for repeat revascularization, no effect on death or MI. Not all drug eluting stents are the same, and I did not go into this in detail today. Some are more potent than others with both uh, benefits and disadvantages to that. And then lastly, I think a better understanding of vascular biology of drug eluting stents is helping direct design of new uh, drug eluting stents and also patient-specific selections. When we're deciding here in our cath lab what stent to use, we take into account not only the stent, but the patient in particular, whether they have di diabetes or other disease processes, what the risk of restenosis is, and then use that to decide which stent to use. So let me just close with uh, innovations over time. 
So if you look at the failure of percutaneous procedures, there was a third of patients in the early days. Now in our lab, it's less than 2% of patients. The need for emergency cabbage, as I showed you, is now less than 1%. Restenosis, the first big drop was the advent of bare metal stents. This drop, the advent of drug eluting stents, we're not down to zero. We're about 5 to 10%, but we are making headway. Stent thrombosis, <laughs> this is the initial stents when they came out. This is when we uh, discovered the importance of Plavix. Now the risk of stent thrombosis ranks somewhere between 1% and 2%. And with that, I'll close and thank you for your attention. Yes, sir. So, uh, well, let's look at the COURAGE in the OAT trial. So the COURAGE trial, to get in, you had to have screening angiography. So they looked at approximately 15... 4, right, they looked at it, 15 patients for every one enrolled. So 14 of the patients, the doctor said, I know the right answer. So I think you're looking at a small minority of patients. So that initial angiogram I showed, that patient would never got into COURAGE, right? He had symptoms. Three quarters of the courage patients were asymptomatic or had class one symptoms. He was unstable. And so I don't think we can take the courage trial and apply it to a wide spectrum. Well, let's talk about OAT. Yeah, so OAT again, we enrolled in OAT here. So OAT enrolled less than one of every 15 patients screened. Yeah, 4,000. I mean, we're talking about a big country. And so when we take studies which have designed with a specific hypothesis, but they're enrolling very few patients. We're saying there's a lot of clinical judgment involved, and a lot of doctors aren't enrolling their patients. So I think the OAT study is right. If I have a patient who's stable after two days after an MI, no symptoms, low risk by single vessel disease, preserved LV function, then I, I abide by the OAT. If I have a patient by the OAT, if I have a patient in clinic, single vessel disease, I can control his angina with medicines, I go by the courage study. But I don't think we can apply that to every patient who comes to our lab. That's sort of an interesting kind of philosophy. I mean, what you're telling me is every time you've studied one of these things, where the extent doesn't help and they harm. But you think that the because you have some greater wisdom that you can find the subset, in which case I'd say do another courage trial. And don't do this to all of these people when the precedent is you're not helping. Well, I would say that clinical research, while it's useful, is certainly not the panacea. I think there's still a role for clinical judgment. Do you tell this to the patients when you inform their medical decision making that the three trials that have worked for benefit for you as a patient have not found any, but I actually think I know that there may be something special that I can perceive in you? Yeah, I, I think patients come to me for an expert opinion. I mean, Chapel Hill patients are very sophisticated in the internet. They know how to look and find this data. They come to me not to have me read the study to them, but to give them my opinion, right? And that's what I do. Marshall. We had, when, last time I was uh, attending, we had a patient who had a really late clear thrombosis. Uh, it was uh, three years after the stent had been implanted. And the, the thought was that part of the reason that patient had thrombosis was because the stent wasn't completely restored. And so I'm wondering about the patients who have this very late thrombosis, how much of the time do you think that's related to the technical issue of the stent deployment and the need? So I would say early stent thrombosis is definitely related to technical factors. So within the first 72 hours, it's usually because you have bare metal exposed to the bloodstream. Uh, later in time, was this a drug eluting stent? So it's always hard to know whether the stent was underdeployed or not because the, the blood vessel will change over time. And, and there's case reports uh, where it looks like the stent is underdeployed. But when you compare it to the post-intervention IVIS, and these are patients in clinical trials, the stent was well deployed at that time. But over the period of time, months, you had uh, the blood vessel had adverse remodeling where the blood vessel actually grew bigger. And therefore, since the stent didn't expose the stent strips. 
Andrew. Yeah, so the short answer is we don't really know. But the long answer is we try to get the surgeons to operate on aspirin. And many times uh, they will realize in the risk of bleeding, it's more of a nuisance in the operating field when you have restenosis. If we know the patient is at all thinking about surgery, we'll put bare metal stents in so we can take them off Plavix after 30 days. There's reports in the literature based on just a small number of patients using IV2B3 inhibitors to bridge patients through surgery with recent stent, uh, recent stents. All those reports are positive, but they're a small number and probably subject to publication by us. And so the one thing I didn't get into also is this different stents. You can actually safely stop Plavix earlier in some of the drug eluding stents. And so depending upon the type of stent that went in, it may be safe to stop the Plavix. Yes, sir. I'm wondering that one of the earlier slides you showed uh, different drug eluding stents, different types, different eluding rates, and then the theories as to what biological events or what's happening in sequence. And sometimes the drug eluding stents were developed by just rapid one of those biological phenomena. There was no difference, is that right, in the drug eluding stents in terms of the clinical outcome? Did that give you any insight as to what the relevant biology is for putting a stent in and what biological events and what these problems are important? So I would just say that there probably are differences between the drug eluding stents, and I didn't go into those because they're, they're um, minor differences and probably not interesting to this audience. I, th I think what we have learned is if you inhibit the cell cycle, you're going to have a positive response on intimal hyperplasia. And that's why I think the companies, you know, the cost of bringing a new DS to market is now over a billion dollars. They're not going to invest a lot of money in new drugs because the Olimus analogs work so well at inhibiting uh, cell cycle uh, activity and intimal hyperplasia that mo most of the focus is going to be how to deliver that drugs. But I think the biological insight has been it is cell proliferation that is important in instant restenosis. What about the complications of Plavix and So TTP with Plavix is much less than it was with Diclopidine. And um, when you have a, a patient of TTP uh, with Plavix, uh, um, there are probably no good answers at that point. We have not seen that complication here. Uh, luckily, um, I'm not sure what the best approach would be. Uh, another problem we have is triple anticoagulation, aspirin, Plavix, and Coumadin, and that's also one that uh, you, you try to put a bare metal stent in so you can minimize the use of Plavix. All right, thank you very much.